The following program was produced by the United States Courts. And welcome to the Accord AO Exchange Program's Knowledge Seminar. I'm your moderator, Charlie Hall. This year marks the 50th anniversary of the Federal Magistrates Act, which Congress passed in 1968. Today's Knowledge Seminar explores the important role of magistrate judges in handling criminal and civil matters in the federal courts. Today, you will gain an insider's perspective on what United States magistrate judges do, how they are selected, and how their specific duties may vary from one court to the next. I'm pleased to introduce our panelists who are joining us today. Uh, starting with my immediate left is Judge Paul Grimm. Uh, judge Grimm has been a U.S. District Judge for the District Court of Maryland since December 2012. For the previous 15 years, he was a magistrate judge in the same court, the District of Maryland, and later served as a Chief Magistrate Judge from 2006 through 2012. Judge Grimm also has served on the Civil Rules Advisory Committee. Uh, moving again to the left is uh, Magistrate Judge Candy Dale from the District of I Idaho. Uh, judge Dale is the first woman federal judge in Idaho. She was appointed Magistrate Judge in 2008 following a 25-year career as a trial lawyer. Judge Dale served as Chief Magistrate Judge from 2008 through 2015, and she was appointed uh, by Chief Justice Roberts to serve a, a two-year term as the magistrate judge observer to the Judicial Conference of the United States. Uh, that duty will last through September 2019. Uh, also joining us is Magistrate Judge Kevin Fox uh, from the Southern District of New York. He was appointed magistrate judge in 1997 and later served as chief magistrate judge. Previously, he served as a federal defender in the Southern District of New York. Uh, he was executive director of the New York Governor's Task Force on Bias-Related Violence. And then he was general counsel for the New York City Department of Personnel. And then finally, uh, on the far left, uh, my far left, is uh, Magistrate Judge Joseph Spiro. Uh, judge Spiro is the chief magistrate judge for the Northern District of California. He was appointed to the, that court in March 1999. Judge Spiro began his career as a law clerk on the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. He became partner in a law firm and also served as judge pro tem for the San Francisco Superior Court before he became a U.S. Magistrate Judge. So I want to thank all of the panel for joining us today. <laughs> Magistrate judges play an important role in the judicial process. We created this brief video to further explain the very significant work that is done by magistrate judges and how the magistrate judges system came into being. So let's take a look. Magistrate judges serve on the front line of the judicial process. These judicial officers conduct civil and criminal caseloads for U.S. district courts. In criminal proceedings, magistrate judges accept criminal complaints, issue search warrants, conduct initial appearance proceedings, and set bail for defendants. Magistrate judges also appoint attorneys for defendants, hold preliminary hearings, and conduct arraignments. With the consent of all the parties in a civil case, magistrate judges can conduct all proceedings, including a jury or non-jury trial, and make final decisions on all issues, including final judgment in the case. In other words, if you've appeared before a judge in a federal district court, chances are you've interacted with a magistrate judge. So, what is a magistrate judge? Fifty years ago, magistrate judges replaced the position of United States commissioners in the district courts. Commissioners were part-time officers with limited jurisdiction. They were around for over a century, until 1965, when Congress, in order to deal with growing caseloads throughout the federal courts, determined that creating a federal magistrate judge's system with expanded judicial authority was essential. Three years later, Congress enacted the Federal Magistrates Act of 1968. For 50 years, magistrate judges have been integral to the federal judiciary. In one year, magistrate judges dispose of over one million matters. There are two types of magistrate judges, full-time and part-time. Full-time magistrate judges are appointed for an eight-year term. Part-time magistrate judges serve four-year terms. The Judicial Conference of the United States determines the number of magistrate judges' positions that are needed in each district. Unlike district judges who are appointed by the President and confirmed by the Senate with life tenure, 
United States magistrate judges are selected by the court's district judges based on recommendations by local merit selection panels. Panel members are lawyers and non-lawyers who live or work in the district. A vacancy announcement is posted. Candidates are reviewed by the merit selection panel, and the top five candidates are selected for final consideration by the court. A new magistrate judge is selected and appointed upon a majority vote of the district judges. The district judges have discretion to decide what type of judicial duties are best assigned to the magistrate judges to meet the particular needs of their district. As judges of the district courts, the Code of Conduct for U.S. Judges applies generally to all U.S. Magistrate Judges. The proper and preferred address is Magistrate Judge, Judge, or Your Honor. Over the past 50 years, the number of Magistrate Judges in the District Courts have increased significantly due to increasing workloads in the courts. As a result, U.S. Magistrate Judges play an important, supportive role in the United States Courts. I, um, recently, Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor said, and I quote, the number of magistrate and bankruptcy judgeships exceeds the number of circuit and district judgeships. And it is no exaggeration to say that without the distinguished service of these judicial colleagues, the work of the federal court system would grind nearly to a halt. That is high praise from my highest source. Um, Judge Graham, if I could ask you to start off, why, is the, why are magistrate judges so critical to the overall system? Beginning in the 1960s, um, Congress began enacting um, substantial, um, large-scale uh, enactments that created civil rights laws and rights and obligations, and uh, over the course of the next 30 years, um, expanded the role, particularly in criminal cases, of the federal courts into areas that had previously been the, the predominantly handled by the states. As the district judges uh, dealt with this increased responsibility, uh, and given the fact that there have been relatively few district judge positions created by Congress uh, in the last 30 years. The needs of the federal judiciary to deal with other matters uh, that, uh, that continued to demand the attention of the district courts grew and grew and grew. And so in order to be able to keep, uh, make sure that the federal judiciary was responsive to the needs of the citizens, um, the ability to create additional magistrate judges through the judicial uh, system itself uh, was where they stepped up to the plate um, in a uh, remarkably uh, effective way. Uh, and uh, took up the slack uh, that the district judges had to spend uh, dealing with these new responsibilities that had been given to them by Congress. Judge Dale, any additional thoughts? Well, and as the statutory authority increased, um, magistrate judges um, were given more and more responsibilities and duties depending upon the district. And uh, the one example is the consent jurisdiction. What that means is civil cases can be assigned to a magistrate judge just like they can be assigned to a district judge. Um, and if, the, if all the parties agree to stay with the magistrate judge as a presiding judge, the magistrate judge in essence steps into the shoes of a district judge, an Article III judge, and can issue all orders, um, preside over trial, wh whether it's jury or bench. And then if there's an appeal, it goes to the circuit respective circuit. And so that has allowed um, parties to agree to stay with the magistrate judge because they know that they're going to get some certainty, they're going to get a result, and they may not lose their trial date based on the speedy trial rights that are attendant to felony proceedings that the district judges must pre preside over. You, you have district judges and magistrate judges in every district courthouse. So what are the differences and where are they the same? So um, the, there are some obvious differences. The, the, uh, as the, the film noted, they are selected differently. Um, district judges are selected by the president and confirmed by the Senate. Uh, magistrate judges are selected uh, by a majority of the district judges themselves. Beyond that, the differences or the similarities depend very much on what each district decides. Um, what I can say is that across the country, magistrate judges work on all of the kinds of civil matters and all the kinds of civil tasks that district judges do. Um, and in addition, they do preliminary uh, steps in criminal cases, starting with investigatory tools like search warrants uh, and other investigatory tools and including initial appearances and bail and arraignment. Um, they don't do, and this is the principal distinction from a, 
from a perspective of task, they don't do, magistrate judges don't do felony criminal trials and they don't do fel felony criminal sentencing. Those are reserved to the district judges. So I want to ask, just to get a sense of sort of the workload difference, uh, Judge Fox, are there any roles that are done only by a magistrate judge or primarily by a magistrate judge? Well, um, certainly on the criminal side, the magistrate judges are, as Despiro said, issuing uh, warrants for search and um, they are authorizing criminal complaints to be um, issued by the United States Attorney's offices and issuing arrest warrants for those who are named in those criminal complaints. Um, that's uh, one area where magistrate judges are primarily um, and almost exclusively uh, handling matters in the district court. Um, there is another area where uh, magistrate judges provide an international role and service, and that's with respect to uh, international prisoner transfer proceedings. Those are proceedings conducted pursuant to uh, treaties between the United States and other uh, countries where a person who's serving a sentence can elect to return to his or her native country to uh, complete that sentence, the sentence having been imposed by a foreign uh, country for criminal activity in that country. And magistrate judges are uh, dispatched around the world to conduct what are called verification proceedings to ensure that the person who is agreeing to return, in this case to the United States, is uh, doing so voluntarily and knowingly, that is to say that he or she knows that the sentence that was imposed will be uh, uh, fully executed in the United States once he or she returns. So that is uh, one area where um, mastery judges have almost exclusive jurisdiction to resolve a matter. I'd like to walk through some of the different duties. Uh, we're going to start with the most basic, which is petty offenses. Uh, Judge Graham, I understand that uh, District of Maryland does a lot of petty offense. Uh, yes, there, there, there's so many federal facilities in Maryland, I sometimes wonder whether anybody privately owns property in the state. Um, but what happens is, is that, um, as any of you may know who've gotten a speeding ticket out of military installation, no show of hands here, um, <laughs> the, the, uh, the, there is no national federal traffic code. And so the Assimilative Crimes Act uh, incorporates the criminal law of each state uh, where there is a federal enclave that is um, either fully proprietary or uh, owned uh, by the federal government. Uh, and when these charges uh, have to be heard, then, then they're heard in, um, in federal courts presided over by magistrate judges. Maryland, by virtue of the number of federal facilities that we have, has the largest misdemeanor docket in the United States. We have over 30,000 misdemeanors. And as I think um, uh, Judge Fox and Judge Spiro indicated, there you have class A, B misdemeanors and petty offenses, and the magistrate judges will preside over those, and they'll deal with the charges that uh, raise in criminal cases. They cannot necessarily be traffic cases, but if there can be substantive criminal offenses, if there's no federal statute that makes a certain uh, activity a crime, then the Assimilative Crimes Act would assimilate that. And so they sit doing a, um, an active misdemeanor type docket, uh, the, the federal uh, courts, the the, uh, the national courts or the national um, parks systems have uh, uh, offenses that they do, and so that they have under law. So the magistrate judges throughout the country deal with that. So the larger the military presence in the state, the more frequently you're going to find magistrate judges doing these types of criminal cases. And also in the more rural states where we have a lot of federal land, we see a lot of petty offenses. And I had actually had one go to trial before me. Now there's one distinction: you don't. There's no right to a jury trial in the petty offenses in most of them. And this was a gentleman who was an outfitter, and he was charged with littering in these various campgrounds that he had ridden through. Um, and with other um, crimes I won't go into, but he wanted his day in court um, because he didn't want to lose his outfitter's license. And so he did have his day in court. It ended up being two and a half days where we listened to testimony. And he represented himself, so he came into court in the courthouse and then he did put his cowboy hat on the table in front of him. <laughs> and um, I acquitted him because I didn't think the government proved their case. So it was, it got a lot of attention in the courthouse. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm going to move on. Uh, there, there was discussion about, um, uh, which I find very interesting, that people can choose to have their civil cases heard by magistrate judges, but my understanding that would be not the entire process. There's, all, there's also mediation and settlement. Uh, Judge Spiro, can you talk about some of the, the types of activities you do with respect to civil cases? Sure. So, um, I mean, our, my 
our work in civil cases, at least in our district, is divided principally into two parts, and they're the two that you mentioned. The first is the consent cases, um, and in that we sit as the trial judge, uh, subject to, at the end of the day, uh, being appealed to the Court of Appeals. Um, in, in our district, that's 175 of those each year for each magistrate judge. Uh, most of the rest of the time on the civil side is devoted to settlement conferences. Settlement conferences are uh, unique. They're very much different than anything else we do as judges. We're, they're very uh, informal. I don't wear a robe. I sit around a table like this one very directly with the parties and their lawyers and talk to them very directly uh, in order to really get a personal relationship going. Uh, some understanding of what's of what's going on in their lives so that you can help even if it's a business person whether it's a business person or someone who's not in business uh, help them resolve the cases it's an important part of federal jurisprudence because almost no cases go to trial they all resolve either by motion or settlement and so it's a really important piece of it and it resu results in some really amazing um, experiences that you only would have if you were involved in something very direct and personal. Um, we have a lot of cases where uh, someone has filed a civil rights case claiming that one a police have committed some misconduct, a local uh, police department, and in some of those uh, the person who's suing is the parents of someone who's died at the hands of police. And those, as you can imagine, are very intense personal kinds of settlement conferences which are as much part of the grieving process as they are part of the litigation process. Um, and it, it can result though in, in job satisfaction is the best way to put it because you get, you get to the end of those and you resolved one of these cases for them. I remember one in particular after I came off the bench after we put the settlement on the record in the case where uh, this uh, woman and her son had been killed by the police and we'd spent several days together. I came off the bench as I always do to shake everyone's hand and congratulate them on a job well done and she sort of brushed my hand aside and wrapped me in this big old hug just because with tears in her eyes just because she was so grateful that someone had paid that much attention to something that was that important in her life and it really struck me about how that showed how much of an impact judges can have on people's lives and how much good we can do uh, when we're out there uh, you know trying to uphold the law. Judge Grimmer Dale can you talk a little bit about any of your experiences in civil cases? You want civil cases or yeah. settlement? Yeah, settlement or just actually, yeah, doing a consent case. Well, consent cases. Um, one of the, well, some of the other things that we do, we do naturalization ceremonies, and so um, that's something that any dis a federal judge can do. But um, many of the magistrate judges do the naturalization ceremonies, and I would say, speaking as a federal judge, that's probably the most positive things you can do is to grant a motion um, that someone is now a citizen of the United States. But I had an extremely rare moment um, in late 2016 where I was presiding at a naturalization ceremony, and what I like to do is I like to tell everyone that's there how many new citizens were um, just naturalized that day and from how many different countries. So I was glancing at the list as I went into the courtroom because I was told ahead of time it was going to be, I think it was 34 individuals, and yet I looked at the list and it said 36. And the name that was at the bottom of the list was a name that I recognized. And I recognized the name because about eight months prior to that, I had, with a, one of those cases where the parties had consented and agreed to have me as a presiding judge, I had issued an order requiring the Immigration Service to reissue a permanent resident card to a woman who had, um, was granted amnesty back in the late 80s and yet was um, <coughs> turned away later, like 14 years later, went through 14 years of administrative proceedings with the um, Immigration Service challenging her, um, her um, ability to be in the United States, whether she was legally in the United States. And 
I won't go into all the intricacies of that of that case itself, but it was not appealed. I um, issued the order. I had no reason to expect or anticipate that then later, eight, eight months later, this same individual would be in the courtroom and had gone through all the steps to be naturalized. And I will say that was probably one of the most, emo most emotional moments that I had as a judge. And her, she and her family recognized that I was the presiding judge on that other case about the same time I realized that she was in the courtroom. And so it was, um, it was just a phenomenal experience and something that no one could have anticipated. Both uh, Judge Spiro and, and Dale have touched upon uh, matters of, of emotion. And um, I want to return to the um, matter of settlement conferences. One of the things that I do at settlement conferences is require that uh, the, the principals, the parties themselves, not just their lawyers, come to these uh, proceedings. And I always uh, invite the uh, parties to address me during the proceedings and to tell me what it is that, that uh, they think I need to know and, and the other side needs to know to try to help resolve matters. And um, it is not uncommon for people to say to me um, after I've invited them to speak that this is the first time that I've been able to tell my story, that someone's been able to hear what my issue is, and they're very, very appreciative of that. And that's one of the things that, that uh, has come out of the settlement conference for me uh, as a very powerful uh, and sometimes emotional uh, event during those sessions. I'm going to ask uh, about something else that came up in the video, uh, which is uh, that from one district, and there are 94 districts in the federal court system, the role of magistrate judges can actually be different from one to the other. Why was that designed into the system? And can you give some examples of how the role might be different in one uh, court versus another? Um, anybody, Judge Grimm, would you be willing to start off? The, the key to keep in mind is that the, the development of the magistrate judge system uh, has been an incremental development process. Uh, from the times when magistrate judges were commissioners, as you heard about in the video, and at that time their responsibility was uh, exclusively doing criminal work, and, and they were paid. Uh, it, it was a very effective way of not having to, to take money from the federal treasury to pay employees because they got a percentage of the fines that they collected. Someone thought through that and thought just for a moment, perhaps that's not exactly the right um, incentive that we want to have, so that if you decide you need to increase in pay that you just issue a few more violations. So it transitioned into what became uh, the magistrate judge's um, uh, position, and as that, uh, as they stepped into a increased responsibilities over time and did well, they kept increasing the responsibilities. So the whole notion was is that the magistrate judges would be uh, able to be used in a flexible manner by each court in a manner that was considered to be the most effective for that court in order to do it. In some districts, that might be that they would exclusively handle criminal dockets because of the volume of criminal cases that they have. A lot of the border cases have border states have a tremendous number of cases that they have to deal with, and the magistrate judges are in the sense of doing that. In other jurisdictions, uh, such as uh, Judge Spiro's jurisdiction in the Northern uh, District of uh, California, they have a fairly heavy uh, consent docket from um, direct assignment, and that may affect the number of settlement conferences they do, and there may be private mediators that step in and take up the balance. In my district, uh, one of the principal functions of the magistrate judges is the settlement conferences which we do, and you've heard Judge Dale and Judge Fox and Judge Spiro talk about how significant those are, but when you think about it for a moment, um, fewer than 2% of all civil cases proceed to trial. Uh, and despite the reputation for summary judgment in federal courts, the rest of them don't go out on summary judgment. So a lot of cases are going to get resolved not by trial and not on summary judgment, and that's where the settlement process occurs. Um, if we provide the battlefield, as in the courtroom, uh, for those that go litigated, then most districts feel that they have an obligation to the public to provide the diplomatic corps as well. And to have a sitting judicial officer who has the experience handling these types of cases on consent and therefore knows the law meet with the parties and try to resolve the case in a uh, negotiated fashion so they don't have to go out and pay um, $500 an hour to a retired judge to be able to help mediate that. And so the ability of each district to tailor what it is that the judges do, magistrate judges do, to most effectively deal with that. And as you mentioned, there are 94 districts, but there's a, there's a unique culture of the bar of the state of each of these districts. And the, and the district courts reflect that culture, and the magistrate judges do as well. And so the decision as to 
to how best to use these judicial officers to fit into the environment of that district requires the flexibility, and that's the type of variation that you see from one district to another. And in terms of how, how do district judges know how to utilize magistrate judges, um, many of you in this room have been involved in what's called the suggestions for utilization of magistrate judges, and that's something that is um, put out, approved by the conference committee on magistrate judges system and approved by the conference. And so there is a, there, there's resources available and an encouragement for how to fully utilize magistrate judges in every district. Just to echo what Judge Grimm said, and that is, is that the culture of the district and the needs of each district change over time. So the needs of my district 30 years ago are not the needs of, of the Northern District of California now. And that's what uh, one of the reasons that we, were, we developed from a district where uh, magistrate judges did principally uh, criminal pretrial proceedings and reports and recommendation to a consent district is because uh, that was the need of the district to have have someone take those the large number of cases uh, in an in a, in a atmosphere where we get lots of high-tech cases and other matters that take up a great deal of judicial resources. And just bear with you, oh. no, go, ahead. go ahead. I said, would you agree that um, there's at times some negotiation between and among the magistrate judges and the district judges as to, you know, what, what we can do, what we'd like to do, and vice versa? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Uh, in our court, the magistrate judges serve on all the court committees, and they oftentimes co-chair uh, some of the important court committees, and everything we do is, is uh, with them involved. They, we have a consolidated bench meeting once a month, um, and the magistrate judges are part of that, so they're very much part of the, of the operation. I, I think part of the success of the way in which the magistrate judges have, have been used in a flexible way throughout the country is evidence of the fact that um, 30 years ago, there was a significantly larger number of part time magistrate judges than there are now. Now there are almost, there are just a handful of part-time magistrate judges that still remain in the system uh, because most of those have transitioned into full-time magistrate judge positions because their usefulness and their importance to the ability of the courts to do the job that we're entrusted to do for the benefit of the public uh, has been so important that they've been considered too valuable a resource to only have allocated part-time. One of the things that is key to the flexibility that the uh, magistrate judges system uh, presents the courts is actually the language of the act itself, which speaks to allowing for uh, the use of magistrate judges in areas that are not inconsistent with the Constitution and federal laws. And um, that was really uh, forward looking on the part of those who were drafting that act, uh, recognizing that things are not going to stand still, that over time there's going to be needs for changes, and um, that flexibility is already built into the act. And uh, something else that, that is worth noting, Judge Grimm mentioned the involvement of magistrate judges in their home districts and in, in governance and serving on committees and so forth. That's true nationwide in that the uh, Judicial Conference of the United States uh, through its committee system has enabled magistrate judges to have seats on those committees and contribute to the uh, development of policies that will affect the judiciary uh, nationwide. And there are also here at the uh, administrative office uh, committees meeting, um, uh, advisory groups and um, advisory councils um, to help percolate um, policies that might be uh, useful for presentation to the various committees of the um, judicial conference for the governance and management of, of the judiciary nationwide. And so magistrate judges are playing a vital role in all of these uh, committees and uh, in the shaping of, of, of the uh, judiciary nationwide. One uh, huge change <clears throat> since 1968 that Judge Spiro mentioned is technology. Uh, and sometimes we got ready for this program, every judge agreed that magistrate judges are neck deep in issues relating to technology. I'd really welcome any one of you take the lead in talking about that. Well, that's certainly uh, been the case in the last, oh, 10 to 15 years where we have seen a real movement, certainly uh, on the civil side, but on the criminal side also. I'll speak first about the, criminal, the uh, civil side. Um, gone are the days when 
civil litigation was built around going to file cabinets and extracting paper records and exchanging them to prepare for a trial or a hearing. Uh, today, most commercial entities and, and most people are uh, operating in uh, a digital world where company records, um, uh, memos, um, are all uh, electronic uh, data and stored uh, electronically in uh, the lives of individuals. People are sending not handwritten uh, letters, but email messages to their friends and family members. And on the civil side, uh, there has been an attention made to uh, mining this uh, electronically stored information to prepare for trials and uh, uh, hearings. On the criminal side also, um, where uh, many years ago, most of the search warrants that were uh, brought to magistrate judges uh, for review and authorization uh, would authorize law enforcement officers to go into either a, a commercial enterprise or a home to look for, again, paper records. Today, uh, just about every warrant application is asking for authority to search for electronically stored materials, um, whether they be on uh, computers, um, or on uh, mobile telephone devices where people are, are contacting social media venues. Um, so that has been a real sea change. And because magistrate judges are so involved, both on the uh, criminal and civil trial, early on in the process, they have become really the leaders in uh, writing about and lecturing and educating the bench and bar about electronic discovery or e-discovery as it's most often referred to. And uh, we are fortunate to have on this panel one of the persons who is really recognized as a scholar in that area, and that's Judge Grimm. So maybe I'll yield some of my time to him and he can talk to you about uh, e-discovery. I think I've just been set up. Um, the, the, I, I do want to point out, I think what Judge Fox has said is that the magistrate judges are the point of the spear in terms of, of digital and electronic media. We, we are all wired to, the, to uh, the internet all of the time. I remember, I mean, you have to understand that in 2003, Mark Zuckerberg was a sophomore at Harvard trying to get a date. And that everything that has happened with this is from 2003 until now. Now, in my lifetime, 2003 doesn't sound that long ago. But there are three decisions that the Supreme Court has wrestled with in the last two or three years, two of which they're wrestling with right now, that demonstrate the, the importance of technology and intersect with the work that the magistrate judges do. In the Riley case decided in 2015, Chief Justice Roberts, in a, in a remarkably um, thorough analysis of just what it means to search a cell phone, a smartphone, what kind of data is there and how it does not compare to surfing a suitcase or a trunk. Uh, right now, uh, the Carpenter case is before the court, pending before the court, and that will deal with, and of course, search warrants are issued by the magistrate judges entirely. Um, the, Carp the Carpenter case deals with whether or not you can obtain under the, uh, under the um, uh, historical cell site information from a cell a phone provider that allows you, for example, having six months of historical data to literally plot out every place where that person was where their cell phone connected with the cell tower and be able to monitor where they were over time in a way that you could not do without digital media. Again, those were orders issued by a magistrate judge. And the third is the Microsoft case, uh, which actually uh, prompted the DREAM Act, or the, 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 um, uh, the, the uh, Cloud Act that just was passed by Congress that um, dealt with whether or not an order by a magistrate judge Judge Francis in, the, in, in Judge Fox's uh, district, he's now retired, but he issued an order requiring the disclosure um, of a uh, internet company in the United States uh, of data that was actually stored in a data farm in another country and whether or not that extraterritoriality would occur. And that was one of the cases uh, held this term. So these are three instances in the last three years in which the Supreme Court has wrestled with the implications of technology in this country as we try to deal with with notions of privacy uh, and security uh, and law enforcement, uh, and all three of them stem from work done by the magistrate judges. And so that is a perfect example of the importance of technology in the rules and understanding it in the work that the magistrate judges do. So it sounds like in, certainly in some of these areas, rulings made by a magistrate judge can wind up in the Supreme Court being finally adjudicated. Uh, uh, judge Dale or Spiro, do you have anything to add on, on technology? 
The only thing I would add is this, it, it, it just mirrors life, right? I mean, our lives in the last 20 years have become digital. And, and therefore, the practice of law had to catch up with that. The practice of law doesn't resemble anything like what I did 30 years ago. Um, and my children's lives barely resemble my lives because uh, we are so uh, attached to digital information in one form or another for entertainment, uh, for our business lives, for our personal lives. And uh, being a judge and being a magistrate judge is about delving into those things. And so we've necessarily had to be the people that had gotten into, how do we do that? How do we figure that out? How do we find that information? And the, the information that's provided to us in support of, of the search warrant can be very detailed and sophisticated and explaining to us how it was that the, um, the officer or the agent believes that there's certain information out there in, in a cell phone or um, out on the internet in cyberspace. And so we do really have to try to figure it out as best we can. Um, with a lot of help in doing that, but um, a lot of research and study on our own. So one question I want to close off this section with is we asked the judges, uh, if any of you have handled a case that might be of historic significance or an issue of national awareness, and Judge Dale, you were the one who responded. <laughs> yes, well, in um, late 2013, um, I received through direct assignment, random direct assignment, um, a case that involved a challenge to Idaho's ban on same-sex marriage and also the, the failure to recognize marriages between same-sex couples in other states. And it was right after the um, United States Supreme Court had issued their decision in the Defense of Marriage case, the Marriage Act case, in the Windsor decision. Some of you may recognize that name. And so this was one of those cases that was direct assignment to me, and the parties um, had the option to agree to stay with me as the presiding judge or to um, request reassignment to a district judge. Um, so the state of Idaho and the, and the governor did consent, as well as the four same-sex couples, for me to um, preside on the case. And so I heard oral argument and made, made a decision on summary judgment um, that was banning, was striking the ban on same-sex marriage in Idaho, as well as striking the, the ban against recognition. And so that, my, my decision was issued on May 13 of, of 2014, went on appeal to the Ninth Circuit, um, was stayed temporarily, but then as other um, cases were going through the court system, and eventually there was the, the circuit split. Um, but before there was the circuit split, meaning the Sixth Circuit decided the cases differently than the Ninth Circuit and the Tenth Circuit and other circuits had, um, the, the um, Idaho finally said, okay, well, we, they lost to the Ninth Circuit and so they allowed marriages to go forward. So marriages between same-sex couples went forward in Idaho in October, October 15, before the Obergefell decision came out by the United States Supreme Court, which then made that the law throughout the country. So yes, it was a historical case and not something that I anticipated the ma handling the magnitude of something like that when I took the bench. So quickly before we move on, because you all have shared the title, what does it actually mean to be a chief magistrate judge? So well, no more pay. Yeah. <laughs> more work, no more pay. More work, yeah. Well, for me, it, it meant um, really being the face of magistrate judges in, in the uh, district. And um, while I served as magistrate, as chief magistrate judge in my district, um, I made a point of attending more bar association and other uh, events out in the community to make people aware of the magistrate judges, the work we do, our availability to serve uh, as a presiding judge for all matters uh, if the parties are willing to consent. And, um, uh, I went to many more events than I would have, but I think that it inured to the benefit of my colleagues, uh, uh, my magistrate judge colleagues in my district. 
Just like uh, with the chief district judge, the, the chief magistrate judge firmly holds the reins of power and authority in his or her hands. The problem is they're not connected to anything at the other end. <laughs> <laughs> so so you, are, you are charged with the management of people who have the exact same authority uh, and, and functions as you do. And so what that makes you have to do is be a consensus player. You have to be able to find ways of taking people with, uh, you know, let's face it, judges are known to have uh, strong views of, of how they approach their work and, and working with them. Uh, and, and keep in mind that, that uh, all the judges that I know are painfully aware of the fact that we are appointed and not anointed, uh, and we serve the public. Uh, and someone has to be the voice of the judges uh, in an organization where you have multiple parties, and that's the responsibility of the chief judge. And it's administrative, uh, it's collegial, um, and it is making sure that the needs of the court, which translate to serving the needs of the public, uh, is accomplished effectively. Um, so uh, we're going to return to a, a topic raised in the original video that uh, uh, magistrate judges are, are chosen in part through a, a uh, merit selection process, uh, uh, which has the uh, challenge of oftentimes sifting through uh, well over 100 applicants. So we've created a short video to give you a better idea of what and who is involved in the process of selecting magistrate judges. When a magistrate judge vacancy occurs in a particular district, the district judges identify five practicing lawyers who have a high reputation in that particular district, and then two non-lawyer community leaders. And those seven individuals come together to serve as a merit selection panel. Now, these are the applications for the magistrate judge candidates. Remember, we can only recommend five of the top applicants. They uh, vet those applications, do their due diligence, talk to adversaries that that attorney might have worked with, supervisors, colleagues, and the panel tries to get a sense of whether that applicant has the temperament, the scholarship, the ability to be a good magistrate judge, and then they would whittle down the group of 60 to 100 to the five that get recommended to the district judges. One way that the process um, protects from the appearance of insider advantage is by advertising the position to the community as a whole. The Merit Selection Panel's mission is to be open to applications from all those who are eligible under the eligibility requirements and to give all those applicants a full and fair consideration. I really like that she was born and raised in this district. I think the community will appreciate that. Yeah, reappointment's a little bit different. There's two announcements that go out. One is to the attorneys who are registered to practice before that district court. And then there's an announcement to the general public that they can comment on the judge and give some feedback as well. A merit selection panel is convened to hear those comments to interview the candidate and then make a recommendation to the district judges on whether that candidate should be reappointed to a successive eight-year term. Military experience, law review. I agree, she has great qualifications. The federal judges in the United States rely very heavily on the work of merit selection panels in identifying for the court the very best people to serve in these extremely important positions. Now, this is sort of an extraordinary thing, really, because uh, obviously without comparing, it's different from the uh, Article Three confirmation process, but from the sound of it, any one of you actually would just send in an application, much the way you would for another job, and then before the judges get to decide, there's a panel that actually screens who their choices ultimately will be. Um, would uh, Judge Spiro, maybe you can start us off. What, what are the pros and cons of this particular process? Oh, it's, it's a great process. Um, it, it serves a, a couple of really important functions. Uh, the first one is uh, what Judge Seaborg highlighted. It, the, the merit selection panel takes a very large number of applicants. Um, in our district, we just recently had uh, 
two vacancies and the total number of applicants was I think around 150. Um, and you know they're all very thick applications. They all have many references to check. And that's what they did. So the practical benefit to us is you get skilled people to look through uh, a large number of applications and, and narrow it down to, a, uh, to five people uh, for us to look at. Uh, the second benefit is this. It's really the opportunity for the bar and the bench, for the bar, excuse me, and the public uh, to have a voice uh, in the selection of a judge. And, uh, you know, the voice in the selection of a district judge is in their elected representatives in the Senate. Um, the voice in, in, in selecting a magistrate judge is in the merit selection panel where there are members of the public and of the bar uh, that participate in that selection process. And as others ask, answer this, could you just say a little bit about what you remember of your own uh, application process? Well, uh, unlike the video, which, which mentioned there were seven people in, in the committee, my committee, Merit Selection Committee, had about 15 people. And um, uh, I was uh, fielding questions from all of them in a relatively short amount of time because the Merit Selection Committee doesn't have uh, the luxury of time, as, as you heard, there are many applicants, and uh, when they schedule interviews, they're, they're not scheduling them for an hour or two hours at a time. You, you have a short amount of time, perhaps 15, 20 minutes with the committee, and they want to extract as much information about you that they believe they'll need to uh, emerge with five candidates to present to the uh, district judges. So um, that, that was an experience uh, dealing with that, that group of people. And I can actually still remember almost each and every question and who asked the question. And they were all around this, and I was on one side of the table. And the thing I m remember the most, uh, looking out here at the water, was I um, took the, did the mistake of trying to pour the water into a glass. And I was shaking more than any other time in my entire life. So since then, I've given advice to anyone that goes to an interview. They'll put water in front of you. It's a test. Don't even touch it. <laughs> well, you'll recall that, that uh, on the Merit Selection Committee, we have lay members who are not lawyers. And, and you know, we're all prepared. We, we've all appeared before judges. We were all prepared for judges to ask us questions about the law. And when I um, was interviewed, um, one of the lay members asked me a question that I um, could not have imagined uh, I would have to be prepared for. But um, she said to me, uh, what is the last non-law book that you have read? And um, at that time, I was a partner in a busy civil litigation firm, and my wife and I had two young children. And I thought, you know, I was an adjunct professor at the, at the law school, and so I hadn't read too many books other than law-related. And I just thought for a second, and I said, I believe it was called Good Night Moon. <laughs> And I was reading it to my three-year-old. Uh, so I don't know whether I scored points or not, but um, that was a question I had not anticipated uh, and had not prepared for. Honesty. Uh, hopefully. So all of you were lawyers, and then being a magistrate judge was your you know, uh, first moment on the bench. Uh, what was the biggest surprise for each of you when you actually got on the bench? For me, I remember that I, I had had experience before I became a magistrate judge as a prosecutor and defense attorney doing criminal cases, both in the Army and also in the, in the civilian community. And I had been in many, many uh, court proceedings where um, the, the, the parties who are usually there in court are all there talking about a particular defendant by the name of the, the defendant. And I, when I became a judge and I was dealing with initial appearances, particularly then when you're dealing with a person who has just been brought into court, maybe they uh, had had the uh, law enforcement came to their house early in the morning. Uh, they were then uh, pulled away from their family. Uh, it's now uh, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Their family is there. They're distraught. And it occurred to me, um, when you do this over and over and over again, that um, within the courtroom environment, the judge is always in court. The, the defense attorney and the prosecutors are always in court. The court reporter is always in court. You have all these people who are always in court, but the defendant is not always in court. And, and it was remarkable how many, we, how many times 
times I had noticed that in the past judges would depersonalize the defendant. We don't even call them by name. They don't make eye contact with the defendant. And it struck me from that point, and I, I realized that, um, I, that, that, it, that what I needed to do was to speak directly to the person who was involved, call them by their name, sir or ma'am, uh, in, a, in, a, in a quiet voice, not pointing my finger. And I had a lot of cases. Uh, where someone came in in a fairly agitated mood. Uh, and I had seen cases, um, not in the federal court, but in the state court, where a judge was antagonistic towards the defendant and saw how that wound that defendant up. But I never had a case in, in the nearly 16 years I was a magistrate judge when I talked to someone with respect uh, and treated them with a, just the basic courtesy that I would like to be treated with myself under very difficult conditions when I just looked them in the eye and said, let me explain to you what is going on here. Do you have any questions? Um, and um, I saw a lot of people visibly calm down. I didn't expect them to call me judge or your honor or to give me a whole lot of respect, but I never had anybody act up. I never had anybody wind up. I had a lot of people that sort of just relaxed a little bit and understood what was going on. Uh, and that was a valuable lesson for us to learn is remember that, that there's, you know, the names that are on that docket sheet are not abstractions. They are individuals. Uh, they are people. If it's a criminal case, the government's interest is important. The defendant's interest is vital. Uh, and in civil cases, these things matter. And that was a lesson that stuck with me uh, throughout my entire experience. One question we skipped over, a lot of you have talked about this notion of consent, that if both parties consent, they would try with a magistrate judge uh, versus a, um, uh, a district judge. If I were to come into the court with a civil case, for instance, uh, why, what would be my incentive for doing that? Well, there, there are several incentives. Um, one is that um, you perhaps get certainty in the outcome of your case sooner than um, if the case is with a district judge. And that's not saying that, ju that district judges are slow. It's just that the district judges have the um, greater caseload of the felony criminal cases, and then the speedy trial time and rights can end up um, moving a case, a civil case, off the docket that has to be tried. So that's, that's one, one reason that you would um, be interested in consenting to a magistrate judge. And um, otherwise it's, um, you know, I think the attorneys and the parties, they go through a, an assessment as to whether they want to stay with the judge that's assigned or if they want to take their chances with a different judge. One thing that will emerge over time because the magistrate judge is spending so much time on, in the pretrial um, phase of the litigation with the parties is that they become uh, comfortable uh, that you understand the case and the issues that are going to be presented and that comfort level uh, gives them some degree of confidence that if uh, they agree to have you preside at, at the trial you'll have and bring to that trial uh, uh, a deep understanding of their respective positions and um, will act accordingly uh, at the trial. The other thing I would say is this, the, um, you know, the district judges um, have a, a tremendously difficult job and they all have su uh, substantial caseloads and substantial civil caseloads uh, which uh, to a person they have to engage in, in superhuman efforts just to get through. Uh, if in, in most magistrate judge consent loads across the country are much lighter than district judge uh, civil case loads. Uh, they are like gems to us, and and we treat them like gems. Um, we, uh, you know, it's a special opportunity uh, to work on a consent case, um, and we take advantage of that special opportunity by giving it as much attention as we possibly can. I think that, that um, of course, the manner in which uh, uh, magistrate judges get consent cases can differ. Uh, there can be two ways. One is in, in about 33 of the districts, uh, 94 districts, they have magistrate judges who get direct assignment of cases. And then the parties have a certain period of time to indicate whether they will consent uh, to the district, to the magistrate judge having the case for all proceedings. The other way is when a district judge directly refers it to a magistrate judge for all proceedings and the parties consent. And what will happen is, is most of my colleagues in my court who are district judges, because of the load of cases that we have, if you're carrying a, a four or 500 case load, uh, both com combined civil and criminal, when you are scheduling a trial, you end up scheduling a civil case and a criminal case at the same time. 
You have no way otherwise you'd be putting things out two or three years. And you don't want to do that. And the experience is, is as you get closer to trial, things will resolve or settle or there'll be a plea. And we take advantage of the fact that, that most of the time we're gonna, we're gonna dodge the bullet, but sometimes we don't. And you've got a situation where you've got a trial. Now at that point, the district judge has resolved all the motions. So all the paperwork, the, the discovery's been done, the summary judgment motions have been resolved, the case is going to trial. You now have a situation where a criminal case is going at the same time a civil case is going. The constitutional requirement for speedy trial trumps the civil case. You say to the parties, I can have a magistrate judge who will take your case and try it on the same day you have been expecting it to be tried for the last six months. All the motions are done and all they're going to do is walk in and try that case. And when I was getting those referrals when I was a magistrate judge, that was like dessert after I'd eaten my Brussels sprouts because <laughs> all the motions practice was done, all the paperwork was done, all I had to do was come in and pick a jury and try the case and that was just a, a little slice of heaven. So that's the reason why you would do it is you get your trial without having to have it postponed in those circumstances is when um, the alternative is you might have to wait nine months for another trial date. Uh, so one last brief question. Unfortunately, we're closer to the end of time than we'd hoped. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground in this discussion. If you were to leave one idea in each uh, person in the audience's mind, what would that be? Uh, Judge Spear, if you start off, we'll come back this way. Sure. Um, the one idea that I would like to leave with you as an answer to that question that appeared on the screen at the beginning is what is a magistrate judge and what do they do? What they do is nearly everything that the courts do. So if there's a topic or a subject matter that you can think of that they, we do in district court, apart from felony trials and felony sentencings, magistrate judges are participating in those things. Um, I would say to you that I hope that you come away from today's session uh, with a, a clear understanding of the uh, pride and pleasure that each of us has uh, expressed in, in being of service to the public in, in the job that we perform as judicial officers, as magistrate judges in the federal system. And I echo that. It's a, such a privilege to be at any um, place in the judiciary. And I hope that all of you understand that even though some refer to us as the lowest tier, that we're really part of, all, of the same team and happy to be part of that same team and having all of you on that team as well um, advocating for the, the system of justice. So rule one of the rules of civil procedure says that all civil cases are to be managed uh, by the court to achieve the just, speedy, and inexpensive resolution of all cases. We could not do that uh, without the combined work of the magistrate judges, the district judges, uh, the clerk's office, and the administrative office. And, and every one of us thinks that, that we have the privilege of serving the people of this country uh, in areas where they don't have a lot of experience because they don't get in the court very much. Uh, and I think we all feel grateful to be part of that uh, collective effort. Thank you. We are out of time. I want to thank our panelists, uh, Judge Paul Grimm, Judge Candy Dale, Judge Kevin Fox, and Judge Joseph Spiro. Uh, uh, so thank you very much for a wonderful presentation today. Thank you.